Today, 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 everything changes for you. There is absolutely nothing any of us can do to change our past. But please know that your decision to join us in the purity of our praise unto God today definitely changes your future. St. Peter United decrees that you are worthy, you are loved, you are accepted, and you have a purpose. Our scripture reading today comes to us from John chapter 8. John chapter 8, John chapter 8, starting at verse 36, John, uh, 31, sorry, John chapter 8, starting at verse 31. So on your Bible app, in your pew Bible, or if you have a Bible at home, for all of you viewing online, please go to John 8, starting at verse 31, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Scripture says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free. And Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to talk to you all today about the truth. The truth. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us the eye of the eagle. Help us to see into all of our hopes, joys, fears, and sorrows. Weave our hand to the gospel plow and tie our tongues to truth. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Let us hear from you the still speaking ever-living God in our midst. This is our prayer in the name of our great ancestor and savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it is New Year's Eve. And I don't know about you, but for a few months recently, I've been ready to be done with 2023. And as I sat down to write this sermon, I thought to myself, well, do we really need to just throw away 2023 as if nothing good happened, or that nothing amazing happened, or that God was not moving in 2023? And the more I sat and thought about it, it came very clear to me that what I thought was a problem was actually a blessing. What I thought was going to destroy me and set me back and leave me confused for a while was actually a blessing. You're probably wondering like, well, pastor, you said you and Marcus were getting separated and you've been going through something and we know you've been sick and we know you've been, and you're probably wondering, what, what, why is he saying the second half of 2023 was a blessing? Well, I'll just start here and then I'll wrap it up to go into what the sermon's going to be about. <sighs> Oftentimes, we think thoughts and our thoughts create our reality. And we don't understand that the more we think those thoughts, we bring those thoughts into manifestation. And when I really sat down and thought about it, I noticed and took inventory that I've gotten 80% of everything that I had been thinking about and wanting to manifest. 
The other part of it is just other people got in the business. But what I wanted, I am on track to getting. What I wanted, I am being blessed with. What I have been dreaming about and thinking about, I already have it in my possession. So not the second half needs to be just thrown away. It needs to be given to God and glory given to God for I'm getting through it. I have made it this far and acknowledging that much of it was of my creation. I just couldn't predict how folks were going to respond. The book of John, the book of John, book of John. Our scripture is in the book of John, the book of John. And, and I love the book of John because John is one of those books that almost did not make it into the Bible. When they sat down to put all these books together, they were going through them. They really didn't like the book of John because the book of John talked too much about us being too intertwined with Jesus. It talked too much about Jesus' divinity. And then in John 17, it says, God, Jesus says, God, be in them as I, as I am in you and let us be one. That was a threat because it meant that the Christian communities that were following that particular book were really building up their divinity in Christ. They understood their power in Christ. And it's interesting because when you think about this book that it almost didn't make it, it's the one that we tend to talk about the most. How about John 1.1? 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or John 1.3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Or how about John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So the book of John almost didn't make it. And today, I thought it'd be good to turn to this book, this scripture, because it talks about freedom. He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not in my notes, but poignant. Usually, there's a watch night service. And some of us probably grew up with that. You know, it started around, you know, 7 o'clock or in between 7 and 10 o'clock and went until about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, if your parents were anything like mine or if you were anything like me, when midnight hits, you got to get home and turn up or get to the nightclub and turn up. And it, it's really interesting how folks be crying and snotting and falling all out right up until 11.59. Them tears start drying up and prayers start ending and, you know, people start, they start tipping on out because they got to get there before 2 a.m. But the watch night tradition comes out of the African-American tradition of when they sat there and they were waiting to be freed slaves. And they prayed and prayed and prayed and were waiting at night till on January 1st, they could be free. So part of the freedom piece I wanna talk about is the truth that this year, and perhaps in several other years, we have been slaves to sin. Uh-oh. Pastor, you don't talk about sin. I don't know why you, you, you said you don't believe in no sin and you, you ain't nobody going to hell. So, Pastor, what you, No, no. There is sin. It does happen. And I'm going to give you the biblical history of what sin is and let you create your own list for yourself. Because you are free to do so. Sin has two roots, two roots, not the 679 in Leviticus, not whatever they told you at that church down the street where the pastor got his biblical license and degree from some garage somewhere. I'm talking about what is biblical scholarship and where the two roots of sin come from. Two things, hubris and sloth. 
What is hubris? Hubris has two parts to it. Hubris is when one thinks they are the center of the universe. And everything revolves around them, and they're so special, everyone must spend time thinking about them, spend time chasing after them, spend time focusing on them. They use people. They, that, that, is, that is what hubris looks like, to just be so pride and boastful and full of oneself, that you have so much hubris. But hubris has another side to it as well, too. When you're so self-centered that you think that you're the only one that has problems, that your stuff is bigger than everybody else's stuff, and that you're the only one that's ever been through that situation, you're the only one that has a boss that talks to you crazy. You're the only one that's got a partner you're trying to get rid of. You're the only one that you're the only one that's having financial problems. You're the only one. So much so that the hubris overloads and you become just an intolerable person to be around. And I read this, this thing that was posted on She Journeys with him uh, yesterday. It says, God doesn't always remove your problems but he will make a way for you to get through them. Hubris makes us ask God to remove the Red Sea. But when we are rooted in God, we look for God to just, I just, I, I just, I just, I just need to see a little bit a way through. I don't need the problem removed. I don't need the sea removed. I just need a little bit of a parting to happen so that I can walk through this situation. But hubris will cause you to miss your blessing. Hubris will cause you to stare at your problem and, and talk to God about it. Say, God, you see this big problem over me? God, you see how big? God, you see? God, and the problem needs to be spoken to. The problem needs to be said. I know that I'm going to carry through this. I know that I'm going to make it. If God parted the Red Sea, surely God is going to make a way for me to walk on dry land through this. Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. Baby, I'm sorry. Your problem is not new to God. And if we would just stop for one minute and say, God, you did it for me before and you did it for some other people before. I got ancestors that have been through this. I got other people who are around me that have been through this. So God, if you have done it before, I'm standing by and waiting for you to do it again. The other one is sloth, humor, hubris, and sloth. Now you might think I'm gonna say just being lazy, but it's not just being lazy. It's when you are so powerless and so helpless that you let others decide for you. You let others tell you what you should be doing with your life. You let others tell you how to navigate your relationship. You let others tell you about how you're supposed to deal with your problems at work. You let others tell you what church you should, oh my God. You let others tell you what God you should believe in and how you should believe and how you should pray and how you should act and what you should be doing. You let others tell you what to do and meanwhile they're telling you that you're getting more and more sanctified when actually you are living in sin because you have decided to be a sloth and to let somebody else think for you. You've decided to live your life for somebody else instead of living your own life. Hubris and sloth. Sloth, going along just to get along. If you want to be happy, you're going to piss some people off. But I'd rather walk in the righteousness of my happiness and sunshine than to live in somebody else's damn shadow. I would rather walk in my peace and my joy than to have somebody that is mediocre and narrow-minded that can't see what God is doing in my life than to follow behind somebody else's vision. 
I think so far that I know, Latreva texted me. We were having a little text exchange. She said, we only get one, Treva, one life, so far that we know. Some of y'all might have to come back, though, because I think y'all might have messed up a little bit. But I hope this is my last one around. That's a reincarnation joke. Y'all can laugh, like, just, jeez. The remedy for hubris and sloth is recentering oneself. We center ourselves in God, not in our tiny concerns or in the Lord's and powers of this world, but we center ourselves in God, Marcus Board said. That, that is the remedy for it. And while I'm talking about sin, because I know there's some good evangelical and conservative people in here, I need to talk about repentance. Repentance is not you rolling around on the ground at home and slinging oil all over your body <laughs> and putting on a sackcloth and getting in your prayer closet for 15 hours begging God to forgive you for something that you're surely going to do again next Friday. That is not repentance. Repentance, again, in the biblical scholarship sense as traced throughout the Bible, repentance means, as Borg has defined it, to turn and return to God and go beyond the mind that you previously had. To turn, return to God, and go beyond the mind that you previously had. If you have been engaged in hubris, then repentance would look like, God, I am turning to you, Help me to see how you can do something for me like you've done for other people before. God, I am trusting in you. Help me to have a vision of how you are parting my Red Sea. Help me to gain an understanding of what it is that I need to do in the midst of this. See, sometimes we want to go to God with the answer, but instead the repentance might look like, God, I don't have the answer. Help me get to the answer. Oh, the arrogance of thinking you know how to solve all the mysteries of the universe and all the problems that have happened when we need to take time to ask God, what? What do we need to do to go beyond the mind that we had previously had? So today, for our New Year's Eve message, I want to give you something to help you go beyond the mind help all of us go beyond the mind that we've previously had, perhaps in 2023, or maybe even all of our life. What will help us go beyond the mind we previously had? Our imagination. Our imagination. David Kesnecki says, Ima imagination is the spiritual act of creation. Imagination is the spiritual act of creation. What we think about and what we spend time dwelling on is creating an experience for us to live. When you are sitting dwelling on your problem, instead of having faith about moving through it, then you actually cause the problem to stick around a little bit longer because you're imagining it. Come on, somebody come with me. I know I like to wallow in my stuff. I know I'm not the only one. You're imagining it. You just keep going. You just getting spun up and wound up. And oh, I know she said this and she said, I don't know. You're, you're creating an experience that is keeping you at the Red Sea. Thomas Trower tells us that the great lesson he learned from the airplanes and wireless telegraphy, because he's an old writer, uh, older writer, is the triumph of principle over precedent. 
the triumph of principle over precedent, the working out of an idea to its logical conclusion in spirit of accumulated, despite the spirit of accumulated contrary testimony of all past experience. So triumph of principle over precedent. Precedent in your life might look something like this. It took me a long time to get through this the last time. And I just, I just don't think there's any way for me to get through this. I, you know, I might have to go, um, maybe, maybe I got to go uh, get a payday loan. Uh, maybe I gotta go run my credit cards up. Maybe, maybe I just need to start looking for another job. Maybe, maybe I just need to go to work late so that way I can avoid this. That is, that is precedent. But principle is God is working on my behalf right now. I am waiting on my part in the Red Sea. I am going to begin imagining myself on the other side of this situation so that the sea can begin to part. I'm going to begin imagining that I am moving through this. My imagination is going to guide me to the answer that God is providing. That is principle. A lot of us are enslaved to precedent. This is how it always happens. Instead of, no, 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 I'm a child of God. I'm seeing my way through this. I will stand and see the victory. I will have the triumph. I, I, I read somewhere and, and, and maybe even heard some old folks say, all things work together. All things work together. All things work together. Every problem, everything that comes against me, everything that I think will destroy me, all of it works together for my good. Woo! All things work together for my good. If you think I'm lying about principle over precedent or imagination, consider the airplane. Yeah, yeah, who, how many people have been on an airplane before? Would you get on it if somebody told you right before you boarded this was once an invention that somebody imagined. But it is. Would you get in a car behind the wheel if someone said, you know, someone just imagined this and it became a thing and now we're all driving one. Would you, would you still get? All things start in principle and start in the imagination. Here's your saying to take with you. Here's your saying, write it down, tweet it, Instagram it, uh, Abdias, clip it, put it on the story. Imagination is causation. Imagination is causation. What you imagine, you cause. What you imagine, you create. What you spend time dwelling on, you create. What you spend time agonizing over, it becomes anxiety. What you imagine is cause. Imagination is causation. Uh, consider the words of the Stoic philosopher, uh, where's George at? Because I thought I'd throw this in for him today. Is he, is he back there? He probably stepped out. Stoic philosopher Seneca, he says, we suffer more in our imagination more often than in reality. We suffer more in our imagination more often than we do in reality. I'll start with this point. Some of us suffer from a lack of imagination. We don't want to dream. We don't want to dream. We don't, we, don't want, we don't want to dream. Oh, nothing's going to change. It's just me. I'll never, oh, I, I, scrolling Instagram. Oh, I'll never, I'll never be able to have that much fun. I'll never be able to be that happy. I'll, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never. A lack of imagination. Instead of, I'll tell you my Instagram trick. When I see stuff that, 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 that sometimes I'm like, ooh, ooh. Ooh, I just wanna, I wanna have a baby too. 
or ooh, ooh, ooh. I want to have a, because this is all in my Instagram feed, and I don't know why, and I think I must be creating it, because I'm imagining it, I guess. But there's this one Instagram account, they're always showing pictures of black gay male couples, and they're having these fabulous weddings. And I, I mean, I scroll, and every other one is like, and I'm like, Lord, Jesus, what is, you know, and then I thought, I stopped, and I said, you know what I want? I don't want their wedding. I don't want their life. I want that kind of joy. I want the passion that I think I see, because, you know, photos lie. I want the passion that I think I see in this picture. I want the joy that I think I see in this smile. That is, that is what I want for myself. And then I just say, hmm, I'm replacing jealousy with the vision of what I want. I'm going to imagine... I'm going to imagine something better, something more exciting, something more hope. I'm going to imagine something better. Some of us suffer from a lack of imagination. Here's the other one. Some of us suffer from imagining the wrong stuff. Come on, people, where are my, where are my narrative creators? Because I love writing a good story in my mind. I will, I will write a good story in my mind. Listen, I will text you, and if it takes you too long to write me back, I've already started talking about how you don't like me. I, who, who? Why are y'all faking the fuck on New Year's Eve? We're trying to get free in here. Am I the only one that writes narratives about things? And I have to stop myself. I'm like, stop it. You don't know what's going on. And then you, and then you know you get shamed because they write back and they say something like, oh, you know what, I was in the hospital, but I'm just getting up. <laughs> that is you imagining and writing and creating something. And, and for that hour that you were worried about them texting you back, you created an experience for yourself that was very painful and written with depression and anxiety and diminished your self-esteem and self-worth. All because the text didn't come as fast as you wanted it to. And every time you do it, you are creating an experience for yourself that creates a tape about who you are. Think of how many times you've done it. It creates a tape that has to be erased and copied over of who you are. Another saying is this, and you can contemplate on it later this week. Thoughts held in mind repeat after their kind. Thoughts held in mind repeat after their kind. The reason you can't stop thinking it is because the first time you think it, this is my other saying, uh, when I'm meditating I, and, I, and I get off track, I always... I say I get on, I, there's, there's a bus full of monkeys that are going by. And I get on the bus with the monkeys. And so when I'm meditating, I have to tell myself, get off the bus with the monkeys. Get off the bus with the monkeys. And you know how I, do, I breathe. I, I just focus on my breath, and then I'm off the bus with the monkeys. That's what you have to do when you start imagining things. You need to say, you know what, oh, wait, wait, wait. I got on at the last bus stop. These are too many monkeys on this bus. I'm not going to try to fight all these monkeys today. I'm just going to get off the bus with the monkeys. I don't know what you like. Go look at furry cats on YouTube. Go, I, I don't know. Do, find something to get you off the bus with the monkeys. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by such such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Mm. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I don't know about you, but I'm looking to 2024 to run my race. I'm looking to 2024 to drink my water and mind my business. I'm looking to 2024 to run my own race because my ancestors require more of me than what I've been doing. 
God requires more of me than what I've been putting out. And my calling requires more that I know that I can damn well do. And so I am looking to run my race with endurance in 2024. All I know is I can sit around all day long and say, well, this didn't happen. Well, I wanted to say that. Well, I wanted to do this. Well, I, and all I'm doing is creating a lot of regret when I can say, oh, I know in 2024 I had that dream, but I'm going to have a bigger dream. In 2024, I thought about that sermon, but I'm going to preach a better sermon. In 2024, I thought I was going to show up like this in 2023, but in 2024, I'm showing up even better. I I don't have to sit around and think about regrets because it's creating suffering in my imagination. Look forward to running the race. I have a saying that I like, and people don't like when I pray it because I say, God, open every door that needs to be open. People don't like the second part. And close every door that needs to be closed. I don't care about the disappointments. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, it'll be a little hard. Yeah, but, I, but if the door is closed, I know something better is going to open. I can be grateful for what's coming next. I can be grateful for what the people that are coming next. I can be grateful for what is about to happen. Oh, I, I saw it the other day. Somebody said, God is working on somebody that's conspiring for your good right now. Somebody that's coming along to lift you up and bring you joy and take you for your next level. The universe, the ancestors, they're all in the middle of working for your good for the coming year. That's what I want. That's what I want. Not a suffering in my imagination. And you know, as usual, on watch night service, New Year's Eve, the preachers always have a little, a little hook. You know, 2003, a better me. 2004, every door. I mean, you know, it's, there's always something. So I made up one. <laughs> Twenty twenty four. Let's imagine more. Let's imagine more. And, bef and, before, and before any of you start imagining that you won the lottery, which I want you to imagine, and I want you to pay your 10%, but before you start focusing on stuff and money, ask yourself, do you need to imagine that you are beautiful? Do you, do you need to imagine that you're a child of God? Do, do, you, do you need to imagine that you are powerful? Do you need to imagine that people are working for your good? Do you need to imagine that God is working for your good? Do you need to imagine that when you step out of your bed, demons are running and the devil is on? Do you need to imagine something better about yourself before you start imagining stuff? If you got some other tapes in your mind, don't start on the prosperity stuff yet. Start on your peace first. Start on your health first. Start on your hope first. Start on your joy first. Start on your love first. Leave the stuff alone and focus on what God is calling you to be, who God is calling you to be, what God is calling you to do. Focus on your purpose. The prosperity will come. Focus on you. Twenty, twenty-four. let's imagine more. I will close with this quote by Albert Einstein because why not? We're that kind of church. Amen. Bless God. Albert Einstein says, logic, logic will get you from point A to point B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Logic will get you from A to B, but imagination, glory to God, will take you everywhere. 2024, let's imagine more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please join me.
Join me in prayer. God, thank you so much for <laughs> giving us minds to think, giving us hearts to feel. Thank you for these lives that, mm, God, it's not always great, it's not always joyful, it's not always peaceful, it's not always what we want, but God, thank you. We, we just thank you for the ability to feel. Because we know suffering and pain and doubt and disappointment, we know what it feels like to be fulfilled, to be happy, to be joyous, to be at peace. So God, help us as we step into this new year to imagine more and to spend time imagining all the goodness and beauty and grace and peace and all of those things that we want to invite into our lives. God, help us get our minds right so that our lives may be a life full of purpose and calling that is rooted in you. God, you've delivered us before. You've delivered others. You delivered the Israelites at the Red Sea. And God, you brought Jesus out of that tomb. And so today we stand by ready to step into this new year and to be resurrected into a new life in which there is, it is full of the imagination that will create all of the experiences we want to create. In 2024, we want more because we know our imagination is what will take us everywhere that we want to go. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.